our last number, we'll turn to page 393, Nearer My God to Thee, and we'll sing the first and second verses. started our consideration of the Gospel of John I do hope that you will give your attention and spend some of your time in the Word and in John if you will read it and apply yourself to these services, you'll find as we go along and at, and at the end of the journey that it has been a profitable time. The past two weeks we have been considering an introduction to the Gospel of John. I want to thank you for allowing me to do that. As I thought about this, I <clears throat> In fact, I've called, I've titled my message today, Launching the Gospel of of John. Launching out, starting out, getting started. And I, you know, I've got a little, I've got a little boat. It's not one of these $50,000 bass boats, I can assure you. In fact, as I remember, I think I gave $400 for it. And um, I did a lot of work on it and... But you know, I discovered that when you have a boat, before you go and put it in the water, there's some things you better do. Uh, You better charge your batteries, better make sure your gas tank is full. And one thing that's very important is make sure the plug's in. (laughs) The plug is made for two, uh, for actually one purpose, to let any water that gets in the boat out. But if you leave it out, it will let water in rapidly. And I've seen that happen. Another thing that I do is when I get to the lake, there's certain things that you have to do. I have backed up and tried to launch the boat and it would not come off the trailer because I hadn't disconnected it from the, the winch. Well, you've got to disconnect that and then I have a, then I have a rope because I usually go by myself. I take the rope and and bring it out and hook it in the back of my truck and I launch the boat and and, the, and then pull up and the rope catches it and then I pull it over to, uh, to the side. I've seen another thing that I do when I get out there is I start the boat. I just crank it and I turn it off because you don't want to run it without it being in the water. But I see so many guys that get out, they put out and they sit out there in the water, you know, and um, you say, well, that's not all that big a deal. Well, it kind of is when you try to load that boat and you can't pull up on the trailer. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? I'm just saying to you that it's, there are some things that we can prepare in order to get off 
to a good start. And I'm interested in getting off to a good start. Please pray that uh, we will be able to, to get off to a good start in this journey. Uh, what a book. You know, we spent quite a long time uh, in, the, in the book of Luke. And there were a number of things that happened in there. And then sometimes I'll deviate because there's something. But I'm aware of the fact that this may be the last book I'll ever preach. This may be, this, this book may end my ministry. I don't know. Uh, you never can tell. I may, I may live as, as old as John is back there. And who, how old is he, you know? And we're still working on that. And uh, we don't know. But I, I do want you to know that I take this seriously. I, I think it's important. And this book is indeed a, uh, a profound book. We must keep in mind that God himself is speaking to us. This is the word of God. This is the gospel of John, but God is speaking through John. And the word of God is given to us that we might know him that we might know the Lord God and that we might know His ways and the Gospel of John is so very important. You know, I could say to you that the Gospel of John, in fact, what I read a moment ago is John's Christmas story. Some people say, well, you, you know, Matthew talks about the Christmas story, the coming of the Magi, so forth. And, and um, uh, Luke talks about the things that were involved in, in the coming of the Lord. But John doesn't. Oh yes, John does. But John talks about the Lord coming out of eternity. We need to keep in mind that God is speaking to us. I meant to say to you last week that John 1, 1 through 5, and also Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, heaven and the earth are statements of truth and fact, and there, are, there is no effort to defend those two statements. You know, there are some folks that have the idea that the creation of man is not really all that important and that really we could take it and kind of mix it with evolution. But I want you to know that creation and God's account of a creation is very important. And we're living in a day when the creation and the flood are denied even though it's all around us. I suppose that we could find ourselves as we get into this, and you may not, you may not see this or understand it, but we could find ourselves in troubled water in this book and especially in these open verses if we try to get too technical, and that's not really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in what he has to say. Someone has said... We need to keep the main thing, the, the plain thing, and the plain thing, the main thing. And I like that. Let me read that again. We need to keep the main thing, the plain thing. You know, I heard somebody say the other day, he told a, the song leader of a church, said, I come to your church and I love this church, I love the fellowship, but I don't ever understand anything that preacher says. You don't, have to have, you don't have to worry about that too much because as you've already discovered, I'm not an intellectual. But I'm interested, somebody said, if you want me to eat the pudding, put it down on the bottom shelf where I can get, it to, it, get to it. May the Lord help us to see and to understand. We need to keep the main thing, the plain thing, and the plain thing, the main thing. The fact is, we have here some basic, factual, fundamental truths concerning the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is Christ in Christ alone. He is the only Savior. May the Lord help us to discover the simple truth of these opening verses. Now all four Gospels 
began by placing Jesus within an historical setting. Matthew begins with his genealogy that connects him with David and Abraham. Mark starts off with the preaching of John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke actually tells us the historical events surrounding the birth of John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In those opening chapters of Luke, we hear names like Zechariah, Elizabeth, Gabriel, John the Baptist, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, Simeon, Anna, and Jesus Christ himself as a boy in the temple. The Gospel of John, the prologue which actually goes through verse 18 that I read this morning, contains many of the major themes of this Gospel work. We hear just in these 18, 18 verses the word life and light and darkness and witness and truth and world and Son and Father and glory. You know, it's interesting today that we're living in a time when words are actually being redefined. Isn't that interesting? But I want you to know that what the Lord says to us in His Word is true in terms of mean what they say and say what they mean. And I will confess to you when I consider these opening verses, 18 verses, 14 verses, first five verses, I am not a little intimidated. These verses, as I have repeatedly said, are profound. It's interesting that they are very simple but their message is very profound. A quote from the John MacArthur New Testament commentary on John 1 through 11, and I quote, the opening session of the section of John's gospel expresses the most <laughs> profound truth in the universe in the clearest terms. Though easily understood by a child, John's spirit-inspired words convey a truth, a truth beyond the ability of the greatest minds in human history to fathom. The eternal, infinite God became a man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious incontroversial truth that in Jesus the divine word became flesh. End of quote. I remember years ago, maybe when I first started preaching, I heard someone say the greatest problem that God ever had was how to redeem man and remain righteous himself. People say God can do anything He wants to. That is not true. He cannot violate who He is. He cannot violate His Word. He cannot violate truth. They say the greatest problem that God ever had was how to redeem man. You know, when God came into the garden in the cool of the evening and said, Adam, where art thou? Adam hid himself and finally said, I hid myself because I was naked. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat? God could have turned and walked out of the garden. But he started there a redemptive program to re redeem mankind. It was not only the sin of Adam because when Adam sinned, he not only died physically eventually, he died spiritually. He received an Adamic nature. And as our father, he has passed sin on to us. And we've been dealing with this, pro this problem ever since. How is a man supposed to be made right with a holy God? 
Well, man's been trying to work that out, but the only means of being redeemed before God must be provided by God Himself. So what did God decide to do? God said that He would become a man. He would live in this world for 30 years without sin. He would be eventually denied, eventually crucified, buried, and resurrected. He decided that the way to redeem man was, be, was to become man and to die on the cross of Calvary. Profound. How do you fathom? How do you fathom that? John's Gospel begins the story of Christ not with his earthly genealogy, not with the preaching of John the Baptist, not even with the actual events surrounding his birth is found in Luke. In John, we go back before time, before time itself, and there he is, Christ, the Word, the Logos. It says in John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, was not anything made that was made. What I would like for us to do is very simply, the time that we have is to break the, these, these verses down and see what he says. He starts off by saying, in the beginning. Reminds us what it says in Genesis 1.1. You know, I told you the other day that the Lord Jesus asked Peter and the other apostles, Who, whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you. I want you to know that one of the greatest questions you'll ever face in your life, who was that man? I said that to you. But I believe another great issue, and some people have never considered it, is Genesis 1.1. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But the first phrase there, In the beginning God. You know, I've been trying to come up with some kind of an idea how to, how to illustrate that, and I have certainly fallen short, but, you know, I used to, uh, I used to build some houses. And... Um, I've always been intrigued with them bringing a pile of lumber and dumping it out in the yard and you go board by board by board by measurement, by cut, by and you put it together to make water. Maybe it's a set of cabinets, maybe it's a room added on, maybe it's an entire house. But when I think about that, most of the time when you go out to a place where you're going to build a house, you're going to have the property. The property's there. You didn't have anything to do with the property. It's been there a long time. It may have been in the woods and somebody cleared the woods and prepared, a, prepared the dirt work and ready for the, the pad, but it was there. And when we think about Genesis 1-1 and when we think about John 1-1, in the beginning God, He was there. Now I want you to know that's hard for us. That's hard for us to fathom because we are limited by time and space. Everything has a beginning and everything has a, an ending. But to think about that in the beginning, God. God didn't come from anywhere. God always was. Don't try to figure that out. Don't try to rationalize that in your mind because we don't have what it takes to understand that, how that God could have been there before there was anything else. He said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And by the way, the heaven and the earth is the only thing that we know anything about. If it's not on earth and if it's not in the heavens, we don't know anything about it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that's where, where creation started. And then, then he started just speaking, let there be light. Let there be this. All he had to do is speak it into existence. But what I want to say to you is, is that he said that in the beginning, God. And the scripture that is before us... Uh, Today, in the beginning was the Word. When you read, uh, 
when you read in Genesis 1-1, you not only have God the Father, but you have God the Son. In fact, we find out that it was, it was the Lord Jesus Christ that was, was the one that stepped out of the threshold of nothing and said, let there be light. Let there be the earth. Let there be the heavens. It was Christ. He was the creator. Someone said many years ago that the great plan of creation was God's plan. And the Lord Jesus Christ executed. He spoke it into existence. And then the Bible says, And the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the deep. May I say to you that that's also true of our salvation. The great plan of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The plan of salvation, the means of redemption, uh, was the plan of God. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ that executed it on the cross in the garden the night before he was crucified. He prayed three times. He prayed the, the same prayer because he understood. You know, there's a lot of things that's going to happen to us that we don't know about, but he knew what was coming his way. He said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But every time he said, Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. He came to do what the Father wanted him to do. To lay down his life. To be mutilated. To, uh, to suffer. And as I've said to some of you before, I believe that from 12 to noon, that that was the period of time when God smote his son. And we'll never understand that. We'll never understand how that God would smite his own son and he would bring the weight of sin. Our sin without Christ will cause us an eternity in hell to pay our sin debt. But Christ died on the cross of Calvary. And during that period of time from noon to three, when there was darkness over the face of the, uh, of the earth and there was an earthquake and, and, uh, and these things... Uh, God was smiting His Son. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? He tells us. John used the phrase in an absolute sense to refer to the beginning of the time, space, material universe. In the beginning, God created. And the scripture tells us, tells us here in our text, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was was with God and the Word was God. May I say to you, please, please do not relegate the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, to Bethlehem. I want you to know, uh, we're studying, as you know, we're studying uh, Jude uh, in, in Sunday school. And when you get on down into Jude, you'll find out that the Bible says that it was Jesus who delivered uh, the children of Israel for Egypt, from Egypt. I want you to know that there are many times in the Old Testament when we see a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And when you get to, uh, to the beginning of everything, God was there, Jesus was there, the Holy Spirit was there, and the... And the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that brought the world into existence. In the beginning was the Word. He was there. He was there. He was present. He had always been there. Before the universe began, the second person of the Trinity existed. He was. And... Uh, on the first day of creation, before there was anything, Christ was. No beginning. No creation. He is the eternal one. Christ came out of eternity. One of my favorite scriptures is found in John chapter 8, verse 56. Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, and he saw it. He said, Abraham saw my day by faith. He looked forward to it. He anticipated and was glad. So the Jews said unto him, You are not fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? 
Verse 58, John 8 says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. He is the eternal one. As I said to you last week, He is as eternal as God the Father. He is as powerful as God the Father. He is omnipresent like God the Father. He is the second person of the Holy Trinity. He laid aside His glory. He took upon Himself the form of a man. He condescended to men of low estate. He came into this world. He said before Abraham was, I am. Same thing at the burning bush. When Moses approached the bush, he, uh, the Lord said, take your shoes off your feet because you're standing on holy ground. He said, I've heard the cry of my people and I'm going to send you to Egypt to get Pharaoh to let my people go. And, he, and Moses said, I don't even know who you are. If I go to my people, who am I going to tell you? I don't even know your name. And he said, I am that I am. Here in this verse, in John 8, he said, before Abraham was, I am. I love that situation in the garden when they came to take him after he had prayed his prayers and his disciples had slept, had slept. Judas and the mob with weapons and torches came and Jesus stepped forward and he said, Whom seek ye? And they said, We seek Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. You remember what happened? They fell. That crowd fell to the ground. Why? Because they were standing in the presence of Almighty God. He was God in the flesh. He was God incarnate. And He was fixing to fulfill that which God had called Him to do. This is the same statement that had happened in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Before there was anything that man has any knowledge of or has seen God the Son was there in the beginning, God. And then he says, and the Word was with God. The Word is a person co-equal uh, with the Eternal Father, yet He is not the Father. He is of the Father's essence. You know, there are people that say, you know, you Christians, you people that believe in the Trinity, you believe in three gods. Oh, no. We believe in only one God expressed in three persons. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are very distinct. God has His office. The, whole, the, the Lord Jesus Christ has His office. And the Holy Spirit has His office and His work. But I want to tell you something. Since you brought this up, you can't have the Father without the Son. And you can't have the Son without the Holy Spirit. And you can't have the, Father, the Holy Spirit without... You, they are inseparable, but they are separate. You say, how can that be? That's who He is. He was in the beginning. He's manifested. We see Jesus talking to the Father. We see Jesus praying to the Father. We see Jesus telling His apostles... Behold, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come again unto you. He said, I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter. Well, there's the three of them right there. We see Jesus baptized by John on the Jordan River. Jesus was standing in the river, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove, and God spoke from heaven. They're inseparable, but they're not the same. You say, explain that. I'm sorry, I can't explain it. You can't either. That's who he is. I don't understand how a black cow eats green grass and gives white milk, but he does. <coughs> Amen? How does a fish live in the water? Because he's a fish. How, can I, how come I can't? I mean, you put him on the ground, he'll die. If you put me in the water, I'll die. Got to get me out of the water so I can live. Why? Because that's who we are. That's who God created. And God is who He is. God's Word brought the world into being. Psalm 30, 33 and 6. By the Word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth, all things... Uh, by the breath of his mouth, 
all their host. It was by the word of God. He spoke them into existence. Proverbs 8, 27. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he is speaking of wisdom, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. You know, many years ago, there was a great controversy, controversy about whether the, whether, the, whether the world was flat or round. Kind of, that sounds silly to us, doesn't it? They were afraid when Columbus took off, if he went too far, he would fall off the earth. You know what they needed to do? They needed to get him a Bible and read what it says. I've always thought it was interesting in the... I've read several books on the life of George Washington. And George Washington, after the war and the revolution and all the rest, was at Mount Vernon... And he had worked outside all day and it had come up a storm and he had gotten wet and got sick that night and they called the doctors in and back then they thought that, uh, that if you bled people and let the blood out of them, well we know, be we know better than that. We know that you need to give them blood, not take blood from them. Why don't we read our Bible and the Bible says life is in the blood. Amen. At the second coming of Christ, which is recorded in Revelation 19, he overcomes and takes charge of the earth with this world when Christ come, comes. Revelation 19, 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And, he said, uh, and the one sitting on, uh, on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like the flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but he himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. I'd like to make an announcement to you today. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ came in this world born of a virgin, born in a manger, raised in a carpenter shop to a, to a poor couple. He wasn't raised in a mansion or born in a mansion. He condescended to men of low estate. He went about doing good. He healed the sick and raised the dead and cleansed the leper. And they eventually abused him and spit on him and slapped him and disabused him. But I'm here to tell you, are you listening to me? He's coming back. And when he comes back the next time, they won't be slapping him around. They won't be spitting on him. Because he will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to set up his kingdom. But how did he do these things through the Word of God? The Word as the second person. Jesus is called the Word. As the second person of the Trinity was the intimate fellowship with God the Father throughout all eternity. John 17 and 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before, before the world existed. Did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ was up there with the Father and He came down here being born of the Virgin and lived here for 30 years? And then He told them, I'm going away, I'm going away, and where I'm going you cannot come now, you will be able to come later on, I'm going away, I'm going back to the Father. And, but then He promised that He'll come back here again and I'll say with John the Revelator, so come Lord Jesus. Colossians 2 9 says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And then in our text scripture, he says, He was in the beginning with God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's all of these things. He was there. He was God. He was with God. He is God, but He separated from the Father. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. You know, it's interesting to me, even around here, when I see a sunrise or a sunset, or the changing of the season, or, or I see the, the face of a new baby, or, or I see the, the different things in creation, just on and on and on. I see design. I see a plan. I see a purpose. But we are bent and determined to, to rid ourselves of God and rid ourselves of the Word of God. But the, th the question I ask you is what do we have, what do we have left? Colossians 1, 16 and 17, By Him all things were created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. Hebrews 1, 2, says, but in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. You know, I've, uh, I've got, uh, I'm telling you my whole life today, you know I've got a boat now, and I'm fixing to tell you I've got chickens. <laughs> and I've got an old Buff Orpington hen, and those buff Orpingtons are prone to set. You say, what are you talking about? Do they set around? No, no. If she could find two or three eggs, she'd plop down on them trying to hatch them. Well, kind of have a problem with my chicken because I don't have a rooster. But my brother-in-law gave me 11 eggs, and I put her in there, fixed a little cage, put her in there where the other chickens wouldn't. wouldn't. And uh, she took right to them. She sat down on them. And she sat there for 21 days. And when the day would warm up, she'd go out and walk around a little bit, eat and drink, and then she'd go back when it went to cooling off. How'd she know that? But anyway, she sat on for 21 days, and finally those little chicks started hatching, and, 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 and it's, so, it's so funny to watch them because they were, I mean, they, they, they know who, who mama is, or they think mama is, and, and you, you go out there and, and she'll be sitting there. She she she'll she looks different than the other chickens. She'll be she'll be sitting there. She'll be. And you sit there for a minute. And you see these little heads go to popping out. And uh, and she'll and then she went to teaching them. She would she would get down there and she I put the feed in there and water and burp, 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 burp. I didn't I didn't understand a word of that. But those chicks did. I know I saw a video one time. There was this turkey, wild turkey hen, coming down the road, and she had all these little old, these little old uh, uh, goslings or whatever they call them behind him, wild turkeys, and 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 there was a, I think it was a hawk. Heard the scream of a hawk, and all of a, all of a sudden she got over the side of the window, and, she went, bum, 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 and all these little old, little old, little turkeys, went, bum. and then I know I'm not convincing you. Know, let me try something else. Those little chickens, it's so amazing to me. I mean, these little bitty chickens. I have this food, you know, and, and I start off with an empty tray, and they get up there, and you know what they do? They go. And I'm telling you, I have not sent them off to chicken school. How do they know that? It's in them. That's who they are. I wonder what they did till they evolved till they knew that. I wonder what we did for eyes until our body evolved the eyes. It's a little problem right there for our evolutionists. I'm just saying to you that, that the scripture tells us and that Jesus was, he was the creator. Whoo, I'm out of time. I know y'all have done this to me. Let me finish up by saying to you, conclusion, that's the word y'all are looking for, isn't it? We're finite. We're limited. God is immutable. 
It's very difficult for the finite to understand the immutable. When it comes right down to it, we must face the fact that we will never be able to comprehend these truths. In the beginning, God. We must believe, we must trust, and we must accept. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. For whosoever draws near to God must believe that he exists or he is and that he rewards them that diligently seek them. You know, I, I told some of you, I had a guy come to me one time in the prison and he was kind of debating things going back and forth and I finally said, you know the difference between you and me? I said, the difference between you and me is I believe the Bible and you don't. What is the big difference in people? Some people believe the word and some of them don't. He tells in Hebrews 10, 38, my righteous one, the redeemed, the saved, the Christian, shall live by faith. Amen. Amen. I am blessed because I believe it. I believe the Bible is the word of God. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe he was there in the beginning with the Father and the Holy Spirit and it was he that created the heaven and the earth. We would solve so many of our problems if we'd just get back to the Bible. May the Lord bless you. Let's stand together. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, for your truth, for your revelation, for your revealing, O oh God. Father, would you bless and guide and help us today, not only today, but tomorrow and this week. Help us, O oh God, to walk with you. You said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what it will and it shall be given unto you. Father, bless us and help us today. We look to you, we look to you for your grace. Guide us according to your will, we pray. John Holstein, would you conclude the prayer, please, sir? Our Heavenly Father,